So this is based on the recent work I did with my collaborators. Um, so here we are trying to solve a problem that's mostly discussed in the uh, gate-based quantum computing community, uh, but I'm sure everyone's familiar. We are trying to solve the linear system of equations given by A times X equals B, and the goal is to solve for the vector X. And we will be assuming that this matrix is very big and is exponentially large number. And the classical methods that solve this problem uh, usually take uh, order polynomial in N uh, operations. Um, Harrow, Hesedem, and Lloyd uh, formulated a quantum version of this problem uh, where the goal is uh, not to write down this uh, vector x, but instead to prepare a quantum state uh, x, uh, the amplitudes of which are proportional to the components of the vector. Um, and under uh, some assumptions, uh, the quantum algorithm that's now referred to as HHL algorithm uh, was able to uh, solve this quantum version of the problem exponentially faster than the classical algorithms solving the classical version of the problem. Uh, so these assumptions include uh, for there being a solution that uh, A is invertible, uh, which means the condition number is finite. The condition number is basically the ratio of the largest eigenvalue to the smallest eigenvalue. And for convenience, we will assume A is bounded by, in norm by one, and that A is Hermitian. Um, and then to get the speed up, actually, you have to assume that A is a sparse matrix, and that uh, the state B, which is defined analogously to the state X, uh, can be prepared efficiently. So under these assumptions, they have shown uh, uh, an algorithm uh, that scales only polylog in the dimension n and quadratically in the uh, uh, condition number kappa. Now, uh, for the type of matrices where the condition number itself uh, is small, it scales only polylog in n, uh, you get an overall algorithm that's exponentially uh, faster than uh, n. And in that paper, they have also shown that actually uh, the optimal uh, scaling of any quantum algorithm will be linear in kappa. And this optimal scaling was later achieved by Ambainis uh, using a very sophisticated uh, subroutine called a variable, time ampl variable time amplitude amplification. And finally, Charles Cotari and Soma improved on the uh, precision dependence of this. So in this talk, I will tell you uh, about two new algorithms uh, that we developed, which prepare a mixed state that has, uh, uh, that's close in trace distance to the state we are trying to prepare, which is x. So the first algorithm will scale like uh, condition number square. And in this algorithm, we will follow the ground state of a parameterized Hamiltonian much like most of the AQC uh, algorithms do. But then we will actually, uh, I will present a second algorithm that is uh, nearly optimal, hence linear and kappa scaling, where we will uh, follow the eigenstate, an eigenstate that lies in the middle of, uh, uh, of the energy spectrum. It's an excited state. And I want to emphasize that both of these algorithms actually uh, are completely unrelated to the previous algorithms, and they are not obtained using the equivalences between uh, gate model and AQC. Um, so first I will describe you how we came up with the final Hamiltonian, whose ground state will be x. Uh, and for this I will, uh, for now, for presentation purposes, assume that A is a positive matrix. So let's define a projector, which is this P sub B perp which projects onto the subspace orthogonal to the one spanned by the state B. And I have rewritten here the linear system equation AX equals B. And I multiply both sides uh, from the left by the, this projector, which uh, effectively kills the state B. So that now this operator I rename B uh, has as an eigenstate the state X so it's sort of like my candidate to be this final Hamiltonian, but it's not Hermitian. So in order to make it Hermitian, what we can do is we can multiply it by its Hermitian conjugate, 
So I will define my final Hamiltonian as B dagger B uh, given by this uh, expression. Now you can uh, convince yourself that this is a valid Hamiltonian, X is its ground state, and it's the unique ground state. And of course, uh, although it's, it has a very simple form, it's a you know, product of the matrix A and uh, this projector onto the state B. Um, but when you, if you were to represent it in terms of poly operators, in general, this is going to be a fairly complicated final Hamiltonian, and definitely nothing like the uh, optimization Kubo problems. It won't even have to be diagonal in any basis, in the, in, in the computational basis. OK, so now we know where we want to end up with. How do we get there? And again, here, uh, the schedule is a little bit different than uh, AQC applied to optimization problems, where you might start with a transverse field. Instead, here, what I will do is I will take the final Hamiltonian and parameterize uh, the matrix, the operator A, so that A of S is now interpolating between identity and A itself. OK, and then I plug this back into the expression for the final Hamiltonian to get a parameterized Hamiltonian. And you can uh, convince yourself that uh, the ground state of this parameterized Hamiltonian actually uh, encodes the solution to the linear system of equations, whereby A is now replaced by the interpolation A of S. So at each point, I'm solving a linear, by preparing the ground state at each param, uh, value of the S, I'm preparing a ground state that solves a linear system of equations whose um, where the matrix A starts as being identity, in which case the ground state, the equation is simply X equals B. So my first ground state is the state B itself. And, and I'm solving increasingly more difficult uh, linear system problems. And the complexity of this, or any adiabatic-like algorithm, of course, is governed by the gap. And in this case, it's pretty straightforward to show to lower bound this gap uh, by one over the condition number square. Um, and this already is good news because we have a we will have a polynomial uh, in kappa algorithm. But actually, we can do slightly better uh, by uh, considering a different Hamiltonian. So previously, we started with this uh, operator B that, um, and then we multiplied it with its Hermitian conjugate to get a Hermitian operator. But there's another way to make a Hermitian operator out of a non-Hermitian one by doubling the uh, dimension and putting this B and B dagger on the off-diagonal blocks in this larger Hilbert space. And this can be easily achieved by adding an ancilla qubit, which is the first register uh, above, and uh, using uh, the, bit, the B of S and its complex Hermitian conjugate uh, in the two off diagonals. So what this achieves if, uh, effectively is that each of the ground states, e eigenstates of the previous Hamiltonian gets uh, split into two eigenstates of the new Hamiltonian and the eigenvalues of these new eigenstates are plus and minus square root of the eigenvalues of the previous Hamiltonian. And since the gap uh, is less than one in the assumptions I, of the problem, actually the gap gets amplified. So we get a quadratic amplification of the gap. Except for the ground state actually maps into uh, two excited states with zero energy that are doubly degenerate. And now the second algorithm, we start in one of these degenerate zero energy uh, eigenstates, the one in which the qubit, ancilla qubit, is in state zero. So now this uh, algorithm has a gap that is only one over the condition number, bounded by one over the condition number. Uh, although you might be worried that now we introduce this degeneracy and whether we can keep our state in the correct uh, degenerate state. But this is um, 
you, this is not a concern because the two degenerate states differ in their state of the ancillary qubit, one being zero and one being one. So they actually don't have any overlap. So you don't get transitions between those two. Um, okay, so everything I told you up to this point can be generalized to matrices that are not positive. And in that case, we need to add another ancillary qubit and replace all the uh, occurrences of this interpolation A of S with this uh, form, where we tag along uh, poly X and Z operators on the new ancillary qubit. Okay, so I want to um, talk about briefly this method called randomization, evolution randomization or randomization method, which is closely related to adiabatic quantum computing. So here the starting point is the observation that to prepare the ground state of the final Hamiltonian from an initial Hamiltonian, actually we can do a set of projective measurements of the intermediate Hamiltonians. And if these measurements are dense enough, we can always obtain the next ground state with uh, high probability. And in this linear systems problem, we have shown that the number of projective measurements that needs to be done actually has a very mild dependence on the condition number, only logarithm kappa square. But of course, doing projective measurements in energy basis is a difficult task. Uh, in, and uh, this is where the idea of randomization comes in. By evolving with fixed Hamiltonians, H at uh, value S sub J, um, but for a random amount of time, actually introduces, causes decoherence to occur in the uh, energy basis. And what decoherence is, does is sort of the pre-measurement state, the density matrix, in the density matrix, the off-diagonal elements get suppressed. And it turns out this step is enough uh, to project, uh, in, enough to prepare the final a ground state from the initial one. We don't actually need to exactly project into one state. We just need to kill off the off-diagonal elements. And also it can be shown that this uh, random amount of time, it's sufficient to sample it from zero and the maximum amount of time which scales like one over the gap of the Hamiltonian. And the number of measurements together with this maximum time determine the complexity of the randomization method. So why did we go through the trouble uh, of looking at this? Because it turns out uh, the, um, the adiabatic theorem, using the adiabatic theorem, we can only prove um, uh, time uh, uh, upper bounds for the evolution time that are that scale like one over gap square. Whereas randomization method actually allows us to obtain rigorous bounds that scale like one over the gap. And this, in turn, allows us to get an algorithm that's nearly optimal, uh, which scales like kappa. And I keep saying nearly optimal because this O tilde notation hides some polylogarithmic uh, uh, complexities. OK, so with this, I want to conclude. Um, so although I showed you two uh, uh, set of algorithms that involve Hamiltonian evolution, we actually uh, anticipate these to be useful in gate-based quantum computers where these Hamiltonians can be simulated efficiently. And in this uh, work we have, in this paper, we have shown that this, uh, this simulation can be done uh, without much overhead, which in turn also shows that the second algorithm I showed you has nearly optimal scaling in uh, kappa. Um, so this, these algorithms provide an exponential speed up under the set of long assumptions that I didn't really delve into, under which also the previous uh, algorithms uh, provide an exponential speed up. And I want to emphasize that neither of these algorithms use any uh, costly subroutines like phase estimation or variable time amplitude amplification. And as such, uh, I anticipate that these algorithms will be uh, maybe possible to implement in near term uh, quantum computers. And finally, I want to point out that, you know, although we started thinking about Hamiltonian-based models, uh, 
we ended up with a useful algorithm for a gate base, so maybe there's room for this mode of uh, thinking to contribute in this uh, gate model algorithms field. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions for our speaker? Thank you. So, um, in comparison to the gate-based models that existed from, for example, Andrew Childs and Robin Kotari, your method does not have these costly subroutines. And so I was trying to think, what is the disadvantage? And what I saw in your um, complexity, you had this C sub M. You have log, yes. log of N plus C sub N, but I, I didn't... I wasn't able to catch what CM is. Yeah, I didn't mention it. I put it here so that you know no one can uh, tell me I said something wrong. Um, C sub M involves uh, a reversible computation, basically computing the square root of uh, the matrix elements of A. And it, its complexity only depends on the precision with which the matrix elements are given. So for most practical applications, this will be subdominant to the rest of the Algorithm. It only enters through the Hamiltonian simulation on the digital quantum computer. So, is there any disadvantage towards the uh, no? Uh, superior? I mean, I wouldn't say. First of all, for Charles Cotteri has logarithmic dependence on the precision, oh. whereas we have only uh, one over epsilon. That's the main disadvantage. Um, can you comment a bit on how easy or hard it is to prepare the ground state of the Hamiltonian, the initial ground state for the Hamiltonian that you have proposed? Oh, the initial ground state, I assume that actually is given to us because that's the setting in which uh, all the previous work operated. So we are assuming the state B is easy to prepare. Either I have a, a short quantum circuit that outputs the state B, or in some other way I can uh, and actually, for the Hamiltonian uh, simulation, we do assume that there is a short quantum circuit that can prepare the state B. Not general. So you can only get an exponential speed up for the cases in which you can prepare B initially. And there's like you know, there's a nice paper by Scott Aronson about read the fine print that spells out all the caveats and all the conditions under which actually you do get exponential speed up, which seems pretty restrictive, but. Are there any other questions? Oh. Is there anything known about if you restrict your available Hamiltonians to K local or something like this, that uh, do you still get some of these speed ups? Um, no, and I'm afraid um, there is not going to be too many interesting uh, linear, like matrices A and vectors B, for which the resulting Hamiltonians would be too local. I, I haven't thought too much about it, but I think too local would be very restrictive. So I think with that.